صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين يقولون ربنا هب لنا ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما. Sweeten your gathering with remembrance of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. As a gift to the soul of Sayyidina wa Mawlana al Imam al Hussein. And his honorable companions recite the second salawat. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower on this gathering with his infinite mercy and compassion and to hasten the reappearance of Sayyidina wa Mawlana Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, recite the third salawat with the loudest of your voices. The world has become an extremely lonely place. Millions upon millions of people all around the world feel lonely. 
even though they could be surrounded by friends, even though they could be surrounded by people, even though they could be surrounded by family members, but they still feel alone. They feel lonely. And sometimes it gets too much. To a point where people feel like giving up on life, running away from life. Loneliness is a devastating feeling. And it's unescapable. And many people believe that one way to escape loneliness is to get married, to establish a family. However, recent studies indicate that in some instances, six out of ten people who are married feel lonely. And that is not something people are willing to admit. Meaning they feel like they're trapped. Even though they have a family, they have kids. They have children. But they feel like they're trapped in a marriage. And they still feel alone. And their agony and their pain is more devastating than the agony and the pain of a person who is not married. Why? Because when you're not married, it's justifiable. You feel lonely. You feel alone. When you do not have children, it's justifiable. But when you're married and you still feel lonely and alone, not many people are going to understand you, sympathize with you, side with you. So, therefore, you feel more alone. You feel choked up. You can't talk about it to anybody. And the Holy Quran alludes to this. That is why, brothers and sisters, I am here to tell you that your best friend is the Holy Quran. Always go back to the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran will understand you. It will offer you solutions. A person comes to Amir al-Mu'mineen and he says, I am depressed. So Amir al-Mu'mineen says, go and read the Quran. A'jabu. He says, I am shocked at a person who has the Quran as his best friend and he is still depressed. Some people misunderstand this. They think that if you read the Quran, the depression goes away. No, that is not the case. If you read the Qur'an and you understand the solutions within the Qur'an and you implement them in your life, it will help you with your depression, with your loneliness, with your misery, with your problems. But if you sit every single day and you only read a juz from the Qur'an, two juz from the Qur'an without understanding, the Qur'an alludes to this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in chapter 12, Surah Yusuf speaks of a young man, a young boy, who had so many brothers, so many siblings. His father was a powerful man. He had a huge tribe. And this young man felt so strong. Nobody can touch him. But his brothers, his own brothers, his own flesh and blood took him and they threw him in a well. Then they sold him as a slave. وَشَرَوْهُ بِثَمَنٍ دَرَاهِمَ بَخْسٍ 
وكانوا فيه من الزاهدين. They sold him for a very cheap, insignificant price. And he was in the middle of the well. He was smiling. So Jibra'il comes to him. He says, Ya Yusuf, why are you smiling? It doesn't get more lonely than this. It doesn't get more devastating than this. He says, on the way when I was with my brothers and I was surrounded by them, I was thinking to myself, my brothers will protect me. No one can touch me. No one can hurt me. I have 11 brothers. But when they took me and throw me, threw me in the well, I realized that I only have Allah. I should only depend on Allah. This realization has made me smile. Allah alludes to this in the Quran. You may have a huge family. A family of 11 brothers. But yet, you may... And Yusuf didn't just feel this in his mind. No, he felt it physically. From there he became a slave. Then he was in prison. It doesn't get more lonely than that. And the whole time you're innocent. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3, He records the dua of Zakariya. Qala, Rabbi habli billadunka dhurriyatan tayyibah. Allah records this conversation between him and Zakaria. Zakaria says, oh Allah, don't just give me a kid. But give me a family that is full of love, full of compassion. Where I find peace. Where I enjoy them and they enjoy me. Where I live a peaceful life. Because you know, Zakaria at, at an old age, he didn't have any children. So Allah, now that you want to give me children, don't just give me a kid. Because some people, they are desperate just to have a kid. That is why Amir al muminin says, when you pray for kids, don't pray, oh Allah, I want to have a kid that's going to be tall, He's going to be built, muscles, blue eyes, blonde hair. This is what I want from you, Allah. If, I, if you give me a daughter, give me a beautiful daughter, big black eyes, beautiful. Imam Ali says, don't pray for this. Pray for something bigger. Pray for happiness, for peace, for joy, for tranquility within your family. And I want to say this, it's not just two people when they, when they cannot see eye to eye, it has sometimes, it has nothing to do with faith. She's faithful, she's a believer, she's a devout, devout Muslim, and he's not. So they don't see eye to eye, no. Sometimes both of them are pious, righteous, God-fearing, God-loving. Individuals, and they still don't see eye to eye. This is the stigma in our community that one of them has got to be a crooked person, a wicked person. And Allah also gives this example within the Holy Quran. Chapter 33, Surah Al-Ahzab, the story of Zayd, the stepson of Rasulullah, the adopted son of Rasulullah, and his wife Zainab bint Jahsh. Zainab was a mu'min. She later on became the wife of Rasulullah. And she was a beautiful young woman. And Zayd was also a good young man, honorable young man. But they could not see eye to eye. And Rasulullah advises Zayd many times, be patient, it's okay. Knowing that it's going to result in a divorce. So it doesn't necessarily mean if two people separate or they go their own way. Or they are in a marriage and they feel lonely that one of them is not a pious person.
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, brothers and sisters, puts a lot of emphasis on the family within the Holy Quran. Allah gives us so many examples within the Holy Quran so that we can find peace and tranquility within our homes. And we have to talk about this in a time where family as an institution is under threat. It's existence as being threatened. Family values are questioned. The establishment of family is no longer a priority. If you are not married, it's okay. You can live with each other as roommates for five, six, ten years. <laughs> and then after ten years, you may decide to propose to this woman. He's been living, her for, living with her for ten years. Now he decided, let me propose to her. As soon as he proposes, they get married. A year later, they get divorced. You may live with someone your whole life. You don't have to get married. Why is it that marriage in Islam is important? We cannot do that. We cannot live with someone if we're not married to them. Why? Because this union needs to be recognized under the eyes of God. Because I'm committing to this person. I'm committing to establishing a family. To starting a new chapter of my life with someone and the witness is whom? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning what? I cannot escape Allah. I cannot escape the eyes of Allah. Allah is always going to be watching over me and my family and my acts. And that is why I believe brothers and sisters, we are in need to establish an understanding within the family. There needs to be some rules, some regulations. And Islam has, through the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, through the Holy Quran, we may establish many rules that help us create better families and to have more enduring families as well, to have better relationships within our families. And I would like to share them with you. First and foremost, I want to say this. As individuals, brothers and sisters, we have two types of relationships. One is horizontal, one is vertical. The horizontal is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you fix this relationship, this will also be fixed. What do I mean? When you look at the Holy Quran, you find that within the Holy Quran, family is related to dua. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, supplicating to Allah. Knowing that, Ya Allah, those problems, I cannot solve them on my own. Sometimes you find crisis within your families, you cannot solve them. The horizontal relationship allows you to maneuver to be able to handle the crisis and the vertical relationship. That is why people who have a relationship with Allah are more likely to manage their suffering, the crisis, than people who have not fully embraced Allah within their lives. And an example of that is Sayyidah Zainab sallallahu alayhi Look at the miseries that this woman saw. Just think for a moment. Imam al Hussein, the grandson of Rasulullah, you've seen Rasulullah kiss him and hug him and say, Husseinun minni wa ana min Hussein. He also happens to be your brother. Then, alongside your other brothers, your children, your nephews, the best of the companions of Rasulullah, the best of the companions of Amir al Mu'mineen, are stuck in a desert. They're not given water. They're killed. Then they are beheaded. And then this woman, who her father was the ultimate khalifa of the Muslim, is taken as a prisoner, as a captive. 
She's paraded from one city to another. While they remind her every second, here is the head of your brother Hussein. She enters the chambers of Bani Ziyad and Yazid, and they're pouring more salt on her womb. The head of Imam al Hussein is in a bucket in front of her, and Yazid, the drunken man, is pouring wine on the head of Imam al Hussein. What would happen to any human being? Honestly, just think of this for a moment. Some people say Zainab cried, Zainab pleaded, Zainab begged for mercy. This is nonsense. You do not know Zainab. Zainab was a mountain that cannot be moved. Zainab did not tremble. Imam al Hussein chose the right Khalifa for his mission. Zainab stood like a lion, like a lioness. She was the daughter of Ali ibn Abi Talib. She stood and she said, Yabna Ziyad, you think those things shake me? Wallah, la tamhu dhikrana. Wala tumi tu wahyana. You cannot touch us. The name of Hussein will only rise. We will only be stronger from this point onwards. We are determined. So he says, so how do you find what's happened to you and to your brothers? Wallah, ma ra'aytu illa jameela. I've not seen anything but beauty. Why? Because the horizontal relationship was firm. So now you even know how to deal with your enemies. Not just your family, not just your friends. With your enemies, you know how to defeat them. Believe me, this one sentence, one line from Sayyid Zainab destroyed Bani Umayyah. This was the beginning of their downfall. A devastated woman gave them a blow to a point where the mufti of Syria says, I didn't know what was happening. I was passing through Sayyidah Zainab. I realized there's millions of people. What are all those people doing here? They are here to visit Zainab. Zainab who was paraded in this city. Now she is the strongest in that city even though she's dead. Even though it's just a grave for Zainab. And where is Muawiyah? Where is Yazid? He said, that point I knew that Zainab was on the side of the truth. She was on the side of Haq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it extremely clear that establishing a family, we need to engage with him. When there are crises within the family, we need to go to him. We need to supplicate and pray to him. And we have to admit, brothers and sisters, sometimes some, some of us have a difficulty with this. We do not admit that we are in need of Allah and everything. Even when you're within your families, you are in need of Allah. Pray to Allah, speak to Allah in whatever language. One day Musa ibn Imran says to him, Ya Allah, there are instances where I am embarrassed to speak with you. For example, I'm naked. I'm in the bathroom. I'm embarrassed to speak to you. Can I speak to you at that time? He says, yes, you can. Even then you can speak to me. In whatever language, in whatever way, have that conversation with Allah. Speak to him. Say, oh Allah, I'm stuck now. Help me. The aid will come immediately. The list that I have accumulated for you to speak about the rules of family, this is our topic tonight, begins with prerequisites. Prerequisites before we engage, before we establish a family, before we even look for anyone. And I spoke about this a couple of nights ago. But there are things that I need to add to that list. Before you think of I have to meet someone who is the right person for me, 
What should she look like? Should she be Iraqi? Should she be Lebanese? Think for a moment. Come to yourself. You cannot make anyone happy and no one can make you happy before you're satisfied and content with your own self. And that is why I want to talk about two points. Number one, masculinity with the brothers. What is masculinity? Some of us confuse masculinity with, you know, you have to be a big guy and you have to work out every day five hours at the gym and you have to have a, a few tattoos and, you know, you have to see who's looking at you so you pick a fight with him. Every day we get into a fight. I read a comment online. Someone wrote to some other dude that if I see you, I'm going to change the geography of your face. <laughs> Meaning, you know, your eyes will end up here and your ears will end up there. What kind of nonsense is this? This is not masculinity. Or we associate masculinity with wealth. A guy, a man, he's got to be wealthy. He's got to be driving an S500, a Bentley, an Escalade, I don't know what. Or a man is not supposed to be emotional. He's supposed to kill all his emotions. He should never feel any emotions. Those are all inaccurate descriptions, brothers. In fact, you've heard of the story of the prophet Dawood, David and Goliath. Goliath was huge. He was like the rock, probably also bald. And Dawood, he was a small man. He was not muscular. But who beat Dawood beat Goliath. David beat Goliath. Why? Because he was a man from the inside. He had willpower. He had dedication. He believed in himself, he knew his mission, he seek the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah aided him and he received victory. Amir al-Mu'mineen wa Mawla al-Muwahideen Ali ibn Abi Talib, he has a sermon in Nahj al-Balagha called the Sermon of Jihad. The Sermon of Jihad, Khutbatul al-Jihad, I believe it's number 17 or 21 in Nahj al-Balagha. Where he says, Ya ashbah rijal walastum birijal. Speaking to men, to his armed forces, he says, You look like men, but you're not men. You look like men. You dress, he wears pants. He thinks he's a man. Why? Because Amir al Mu'mineen, listen to this. You want to know what a man is all about? How Amir al Mu'mineen wants you to be, what a man is in the dictionary of Amir al Mu'mineen, Muawiyah had come with his troops and they had looted many cities. And they had gone to non Muslim women and they had taken their jewelry away from them. Give us your jewelry. The woman gave their jewelry and they started crying. They took our jewelry, they took our jewelry. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, if a man dies out of sorrow and sadness after hearing this, I would not blame him. This is terrible news. So Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen says, get up, let's go. After the battle of Safin, we have to march to Muawiyah again. We cannot allow him to do this. So they said, Ya Ali, we're tired. We're tired. We just came out of a battle. It's hot now. A few months later, they said, it's cold now. So he said to them, Ya ashbah rijal wa lastum rijal You look like men, but you're no men. A man will rise to the occasion. A man will defend himself and his family and his territory and his land. And because... When we speak of masculinity, automatically toxic masculinity. 
So a lot of people, to avoid toxic masculinity, now we have a lot of shabab, we have a lot of the youth that are very soft. The exact opposite. And that's very disturbing. That's very disturbing. But what do I mean by soft? Don't say, no, I'm, I ain't no softy, I'm not. No, no, that's not what I mean. I mean rise to the occasion. Be responsible. Is your, did you, I said this the other day. Do you make your bed? Are you responsible? How many responsibilities do you have? Do you execute your responsibilities? Are you looking forward to a, a future of success? Are you waking up early? Or are you spending the whole time video games? Gaming. Brothers, wallah, wallah, wallah. I said wallah three times on the member of Imam al-Hussein. You will regret every minute of the hour that you've spent gaming in your life. Now you don't realize it. Now you're young. You don't know this precious gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Your greatest enemy today is gaming. Check back with me in 10 years. When some of your friends, the nerds, those who are, you know, loners, and nobody cares for them, nobody looks at them because he doesn't care what shoes he's wearing and how his shirt looks, becomes the CEO of the company that you work for, check back with me. The guy that goes the extra mile, He's going to be your boss in 10 years. This is just how it is. No, I'm some sort of genius. And I'm going to... There's no such thing. Don't fool yourself, please. But we also need to toughen up our men. Let them go see the poor people, how they live. Let them get... Give them some responsibilities. Let them know that not everything they ask for, you give them right away. Let them earn it. Because tomorrow when he leaves your home, he has to face reality. And the world is a tough place out there. If you spoil your children with giving them everything that they want, tomorrow there will be a big shock for them. And they can't hear a no from anybody. Because they always heard yes, 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 yes. Especially from the moms. Now let's shift to this side. Femininity. It also can be toxic. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alludes to this in the Holy Quran, Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter 33. Have you heard of men falling in love as, at first sight? Of course we all have. But have you heard of men falling in love with a woman's voice? Yes. He speaks, he hears her over the phone. Oh my God, she's got to be the most beautiful thing ever. She sounds amazing. And the reality is, it's probably not the case. Allah in the Quran gives this advice to women. And this is some serious advice. When you make your voice extremely soft and seductive, it is inappropriate. The way that some women walk is inappropriate. The way she walks, yes, say it, are you? Yes, the way that a woman walks, that is also in the Holy Quran. The way she behaves, the way she speaks to foreign men. And the sisters, the, both, I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. That is condemned in the Holy Quran. We have to be modest. Why? Because we will get used to so much attention. At school we get attention. At work we get attention. When we go out we get attention. We get attention everywhere. But then, attention from one single person will never be enough. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alludes to those things in the Holy Quran. 
So those are the two things that I wanted to talk about, masculinity and femininity. Now, some people, before I engage with the rules within the family, some people, be, when they want to get to know someone, when they want to start a relationship, when they want to find happiness, where do they go? Where do they go? Dating apps. Dating apps. And I've heard this from many people say that I can't find the right person. It's so difficult. Where have you been looking? A few dating apps. It's called a dating app. That's what it's called, a dating app. What are you doing looking for marriage on a dating app? It's not going to work. If you've made the mistake once and you've made it tw two times and three times and five times and ten times, guess what? It's still not going to work. That is why it's called a dating app. Uh, look, I in no shape or form I'm against people getting to know one another, get to know one another, speak to one another, go out with one another, make sure that you're compatible with one another, but re use the right platform. Sometimes when you plant a seed in fertile land and you take care of it, it grows to be a very healthy plant. But when you plant that seed in the wrong, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a soil that's not fertile, it's, it's going to grow, you know, sideways. The other way around. Again, I want to add this. I hope the brothers won't be disappointed. But if a guy comes up to you at the mall and gives you his number, he doesn't want to marry you. He's not looking for marriage. If a person, it is his first fight, he's seen you walk in the mall. What does he know about you? Does he know your family? Does he know your akhlaq? Does he know your values? Does he know where you graduated from? Does he, he doesn't know anything about you. So for him to come and say, Assalamu alaikum, salam. My name is Ali, and I'm interested in marriage. Can you take my number? How are you, how did you figure out that she's the right person for you? And, you know, somehow, this is, like I said, you know, this is not The Bachelor's show. So let's be real. And once again, I'd like to say this, that we have to find alternatives, better ways for people to communicate, to get to know one another, and to create, to start the step on a serious note. So when a person comes to the community and says, I want to get married, we ask him the questions that I asked about his masculinity, about her femininity, about their responsibilities. There is a list. Do you do them? If it's a yes, then we introduce them to other individuals within the community. Let's facilitate so that we make sure within our communities there is happy families. And there is nothing that pleases Allah more. Now, I'd like to speak on a few rules. Number one, when inshallah you start a family and you have a family, the first thing that you have to keep in mind is do not belittle your spouse. Or even before you get into marriage, you're getting to know someone, you're with someone, do not belittle your partner. Do not disrespect your spouse, even if it's a joke. When does this apply? Because I don't have a lot of time and I have 13 things to share with you. I'll spend one minute on each one. If a man, for example doesn't have the best income. He cannot provide the most luxurious home. He cannot provide the most luxurious vehicle. He's not a wealthy man. Don't shame him. Do not insult him. Do not belittle him. If anything, encourage him to go out there, to work hard, to be more productive, and facilitate for that. But belittling your spouse slowly but surely will decrease the respect between the two. 
And once there is no respect, even if you are Romeo and Juliet, say bye-bye to that marriage. But if he's not your Romeo, and you're not his Juliet, but there is respect, it's still possible for us to endure a relationship. Number two, let the sun not go down on your wrath. Before you go to sleep, try to resolve your problems. Speak about them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayuha al-lazina amanu dkhulu fi silmi kaffah. Enter in the abode of peace. Peace means what? Tranquility. It means I go to sleep at night and I'm comfortable. Do not let this shaitan come and whisper in your ear. She made the mistake. Why would you say sorry? He made the mistake. Why would you say sorry? Let it be. Let her, you know, ignore her for three days. This, that, that's all from the shaitan. And that doesn't just, by the way, apply to your family. Apply to your spouse. It applies to your children. It is applies to your spouse, it applies to your parents, it applies to your friends, it applies to your relatives. Don't let an argument develop into animosity. Number three, and this is very important, please take this very seriously. For those who are married, and for those who plan to get married, before marriage, many people are attractive. You know, they want to remain attractive. But when they get married, Somehow, things change. That plays a huge role in marriage. Remain attractive. Let me say it again. Remain attractive. The way you dress, your personal hygiene. Please go to the barber. Some people, I, I, I spoke about this, as some people say, it. well, not everybody's rich enough to go to the barber. Come on. Going to the barber, your personal hygiene is as important as your food. Cut down from two of your meals, go to the barber. Look at it this way. It's very important. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that a mu'min, as a person who cares for himself, how he looks, how she looks, especially when it comes to personal hygiene. Remain attractive for your spouse. Let me say this. Rasulullah, Ahlul Bayt, they teach us that to remain attractive in the eyes of your spouse. Why? So they don't look elsewhere. So you are the only person who they look at. And then when they look at you, they are attracted to you. And they smile when they look at you. And I have, some, I have seen some people, after marriage, خلص, as they say, they let it go, you know. There's no... Why? Because now I'm married, who cares? <sighs> Number four, this is very important as well. Jealousy versus غيره. Being غيور. Jealousy versus being protective. In Islam, brothers and sisters, the men are being taught by Allah, Rasulullah and the Quran that we have to be protective of our families, not controlling, not, you know, give me your phone every five minutes, let me check your emails, you cannot have a password. That's just a freak. No. Or for example, you know, you have a GPS. That's nonsense. But you have to be protective of your family, of your children, of your spouse. I have to say this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased. I don't know about the people. Sometimes a man needs to speak to his wife about the way she dresses. If it's too revealing, 
If it's not appropriate, it's okay. And women enjoy a man who gives them that attention. Who's protective of them. Who cares? Let her wear whatever she wants. That's positive masculinity. A man who is protective of his family. Who doesn't want the rest of the world to enjoy his wife. This is very important. And this is Islamic brothers and sisters. Don't let the West corrupt you with this hip-hop culture that, no, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a free person. I, I'll wear whatever I want. I'll do whatever I want. If he tells me what to wear, I'm going to... There's no such thing. A family is a union, is a unit of harmony and respect. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says, I have ghira on the women of my family. And that is something important. <sighs> Jealousy is not good, but having ghira to be protective of your family is extremely essential. Number five. I see a lot of people in the West making this mistake. They join their bank accounts. She's working, she's you know, making 50, 60, 70,000 a year. He's making 100,000 a year. They join all the... And then, that's good at the time of peace. Truce, this is good. They spend together. They go on vacations together. They buy furniture together. But God forbid when there is a problem. My advice, keep your finances separate. Have something joint, yes, for you to... You have an agreement on, for example, how much you need to spend on the house and certain things. If you have an agreement, that's good. The rest, keep them separate. And I want to say this. All of you know this. It is the man's responsibility to spend in the house. So if his wife chooses to separate her account and say, you know what, this is mine, it is hers. Islamically, it is her money. She's not required to spend a dime on the house. She's not required to give you a penny of her money. This is the Islamic opinion. If she gives you or she helps, this is her generosity. May Allah bless her. But if she says, no, my accounts are separate. I'm a dentist. I'm an attorney. My accounts are separate. Well, don't you want to pitch in to buy furniture? No, I don't. Khalas, it's the end of story. Don't complain. Don't say, well, no, I cannot afford this. Buy what you afford. You can't afford it? Khalas, you don't have to do it. But don't have your eyes on your money's, on your wife's money. This is not manly. Teach yourself from a young age that when I grow up, I will be the man of the house. I will spend on my children. I will spend on my wife. Maybe you'll marry a wife that's, you know, inherited millions of dollars. Or she has millions of dollars. You still have to spend at the house. You are responsible for that. That is Islamic masculinity. Number six. Listen to what they're not saying. And that is very important. With your children, with your spouse. Sometimes people act in certain ways. They're not willing to say the words. Listen to what they're not saying. The way she behaves, the way he behaves. It tells you a lot. Listen to that. You know, sometimes you see some people complaining about certain things. And it's not about that particular issue. It's about something else. Go find it. Look for it. Number eight. Never be, never be too busy for loved ones. This is very important, brothers and sisters. Spend time with your loved ones. Especially with your parents, if they've aged. Spend time with them. Don't neglect them. Don't forget them. And for fathers and mothers to spend time within the family, with their children. People are more important than things. What are things? Things, money is things. People are more important than work. Loved ones are always important. Love equals time. Make this a rule. Love equals? Don't tell me I love you, but 
You never want to spend time with me. Even with Allah, Allah says, you love me, spend time with me. Don't say, oh, I exi Allah exists in my heart. But you don't spend time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Love equals time. Make this a rule in your life. Forgive. 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 A family without forgiveness can never survive. Believe me. If there is no forgiveness within a family, a family is bound to break. You have to forgive. And I want to speak to the young men and women here. I don't have time to get into uh, examples. Three or four rules with the young brothers and friends. Those who have parents, but they are not parents themselves. Because when you become a parent, you, your life changes. The way you think of things changes. Your perspective on life changes. But prior to becoming a parent, you don't know what your parents go through. So I want to say one. One, your parents are people too. Listen to me. Your parents have given you everything. They sacrifice everything, whether it's their time, whether it's their wealth, it's their health, it's everything they have, they've given to you. You have to recognize that they are people too. If you see your parents going overboard, tell them, listen, you've given me enough. You have to do this. You have to do this. You have to go to your parents and say, listen, you need a break too. You need to enjoy life too. You need to enjoy your hobbies too. We appreciate you. You have done enough for us. Don't always sit there. More, more, more. This is wrong. This will ruin your relationship with your parents. If you want happy parents, so you can have a happy family, consider them people too. They deserve a break as well. And make the house a fun place. Some of, especially the teenagers. If it's not their way, if they don't get that, what they want, they go in the room, bang the door, lock the door, nobody talks to me, I'm not going to come out for food, I'm not going to speak to anyone, don't do this. You're hurting your parents. You're destroying your parents. Don't do this. Instead, come out, speak, laugh. Just like when you're with your friends and you're cracking jokes and you're laughing. and Make the house a fun place as well for your parents. Some of us, we think our parents are our servants. We go to them only when we need something. Number two. One more. You will always, listen to me, you will always need your parents. Once a parent, always a parent. You will not run away from your parents. You cannot afford running away from your parents. Believe me. Don't say, well, until the day I'm 18, I'm, I'm out those doors, I'm never coming back, I don't want to speak to them. That is nonsense. I invite you to revisit those thoughts. You will always need your parents. When you're away from your parents, your mom, you will miss the way she looks at you, even if she's upset with you. The way she speaks to you, the way she wakes you up, the way she gives you breakfast, the way she washes your clothes, the way she looks after you, the way she looks at, hears your complaints. You will always need your parents. Even if, inshallah, they live long, they live 100 years and you're 70, 75 years old, you will still need your parents. You will still miss your parents. Maybe not financially, but you need to speak to them. You need to see them. You need to know that they're doing well. Don't plan your life in a way that I'm going to escape home. Instead, if you are smart, believe me, you will plan it the other way around. How can I stay home as much as I can? See my parents as much as I can. Spend quality times with my parents as much as I can. 
You always will need your parents. Don't look at what you see on TV and, and social media of people who I, I'm, you know, I'm by myself, I'm independent. A person, let me say this very quickly, a person is taken by Hajjaj. Hajjaj was a man who would take people and he would behead them. He was a tyrant in Iraq. He took a man, he was whipping him. You have to confess on a crime. He said, I haven't committed the crime. Why should I confess? Either way, you're going to kill me. I confess, you kill me. I don't confess, you kill me. Kill me. I'm not going to confess. I didn't do this. Look at this evil man, Hajjaj. He says, go bring his son. They bring his son. As soon as they start whipping his son, he says, okay, I will confess. I will confess. They told him, why? Why did you confess? He said, because those whips were falling on my back. I can handle them. But now they're falling on my heart. I cannot handle them. You have to understand that your parents love you. They adore you. You're the most important thing in their life. What are you thinking escaping from them? Ignoring them, running away from them. You will always need your parents. Number three, seek advice from them. They're, your parents have 30 years more experience than you do. They have seen the ups and downs of life. Seek their blessings. Seek advice from them. Consult them. Even if you're now, you know, you are independent, you're on your own, you're making your own money, ask for their advice. I'm not saying in every single occasion you have to take their advice, but listen to it. Listen to it with your heart, not with your ears. That is why in the religion of Islam, it's important for people before they engage in marriage to consult their parents. This person, this father, this mother who took care of you, you were awake all night crying and they were both awake taking care of you. This mother that kept you in her room for nine months took care of you now at the age 25. You don't care for her opinion? To even ask her for her opinion? To speak with her? To see if she's happy or not? And lastly, always put before you panic. Before you panic, before you get upset, before you go in your room and you lock the door, put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself in their shoes for a second. Say, listen, I have a puppy. Imagine you have a puppy. You have a chicken. You have anything. You have a whatever, a pet. And you've taken care of this pet for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. And you call this puppy, come. <laughs> Say, what's wrong with this puppy? He's not listening to me today. You'll get upset with a puppy, let alone your own son. Put yourself in their shoes. Maybe they're wrong. Maybe what they're doing is wrong. But they're panicking because they want the best for you. I said this yesterday, brothers and sisters. I said this yesterday. In this community, someone told me a hundred plus individuals were buried in one month, in one year. Why? Because of drugs. Alcohol, gang violence, from our community. So as a parent, you're afraid. This is going to happen to my children. And they panic. So even if they make a mistake, give them the benefit of the doubt. Look at things from their perspective. You'll be un able to under understand them better. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring joy, to bring comfort, to bring tranquility to all of our families, inshaAllah. وصلوا على محمد وآل محمد. Unfortunately, we don't have time, much time for the Aza, but I would like to take your hearts now to the city of Karbala. Let us take our hearts, our minds, our souls to Imam Al Hussein all together. Let us salute him one more time. And say to him, Ya Sayyidana wa Mawlana. Ya Sayyidana wa Mawlana. Inna 
توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا All of us together يا وجيها عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا وجيها One more time, for those who have issues within their families, they have asked us for dua. One more time, let us call upon him. Ya wajihan inda Allah Tonight is dedicated to the messenger of Imam al Hussein. The first martyr in the camp of Imam al Hussein, his cousin, his beloved, his brother Muslim, Ibn Aqil, who arrived to Kufa. He arrived to Kufa and he was greeted by the thousands. They surrounded him. You're the messenger of Hussein and you all know the story of Muslim. Soon enough, why? Because Muslim wasn't saying the things that pleased the people. Muslim wasn't doing that which people were pleased with. They were afraid for their incomes, for their businesses, for whatever it was that was attached to the world. They left him, neglected him. After Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, after Salat al-Isha, Muslim ibn Aqil, the messenger of Imam al Hussein, who was the messenger of Allah, because Imam al Hussein is a representative of Allah, was left all alone. Allahu Akbar. Walking in the streets of Kufa, he arrived to the house of a woman. Her name was Tawa. He says to her, Ya Amat Allah, I am thirsty. Maybe you give me some water. He drank. Then he said, I am also hungry. She said to him, Why are you thirsty and hungry? Don't you have a home? Don't you have a place to go? He said, No, I am gharib. I don't have anybody in this city. Who are you? He says, I am Muslim ibn Aqil. Muslim ibn Aqil? The messenger of Hussein, indeed I am the messenger of Hussein. She says, wow unto you, O people of Kufa. You've done it again. You've left Muslim ibn Aqil all alone. Shame on you, O Muslim. Come to my house, but be careful. Be careful. There is a lot of money given to those who are going to expose your whereabouts. And my son works for Bani Umayyah. So be in hiding. Be careful. Allahu Akbar, her son comes and he realizes Muslim ibn Aqil was in the house. The mother begs him, she says, please don't do this. Don't bring in the wrath of Allah into our home. This is the messenger of Hussein. But from one end, the shaitan is whispering in his ears, gold, silver, money. He goes and he tells of the whereabouts of Muslim ibn Aqil. They come to Muslim. They take him to the top of the palace of Bani Ziyad. They're about to throw him down the palace. He says one word. He looks towards the camp of Imam al Hussein. He says, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Peace and blessings be upon you, O Imam Hussein. I sent you a letter to come, but I wish I can correct that letter and tell you, Ya Aba Abdullah, the people of Kufa have failed you. Do not come towards Kufa. Then he says to them, allow me to pray two rak'ah of salah. It is my last words with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Suddenly they saw the body of Muslim ibn Aqil collapse from the top of the palace of Ibn Ziyad and they dragged his body in the streets of Kufa. The news reached Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein said, the first thing you do is bring me the Aitam of Muslim. Allow me to kiss them. Allow me to comfort them. They brought them to Imam al Hussein. He kissed them. He said, from now on, I am your father. They said to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, it appears though that we have become orphans. He says, yes indeed, but I am here to take care of you. 
I tell him, Ya Sayyidi, Ya Aba Abdullah, who was there to take care of your orphans on the 10th of Muharram? Running from one tent to another, escaping the fires, escaping the enemies. Allahu Akbar. Sayyida Zainab doesn't know which one of the orphans she's going to take care of. Which one of the orphans will she embrace? Which one of the orphans that's crying she's going to comfort? Assalamu ala al Hussein. وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته